All right. Hello and welcome to our webinar, Boost Your Employee Wellbeing. Um, this webinar is organized together with Goodwill, Breaks Finland, Danish UK Association and Finnish British Chamber of Commerce. And before I introduce you to our speakers, um, let's go through some housekeeping rules for today. Um, we hope that all the participants keep their video and mics muted throughout the presentations and keep in mind that this webinar will be recorded. If you have any questions, you can leave them to our Q&A function at the bottom. Um, and if you experience any technical issues, you can also use the Q&A function. So today our speakers will be Jackie Brown, the HR manager at Goodwill, Jana Komsjaharkanen, the CEO and co-founder of Breaks Finland, and Sara Koivisto, the voice coach, singer and singing teacher. Um, and please remember to stay until the end of the webinar where uh, Jana and Sara will host as a little break session as well. Um, I guess that's all for me, so I'll give the floor to Jana. Jana, I think you're muted. Hello everyone, technical issues. Greetings from sunny Helsinki. My name is Jana Komsa Harkonen, also known as the unpronounceable, as regardless where you're coming from, I get the question of my last name. It is the unpronounceable, either you're coming from Finland or from UK or any other country. So I agree with that. Today we have a very important topic. We're talking about employee well-being. And I guess that that's like a hot potato now throughout the world when the existing world changed year ago dramatically. And let's talk about the figures first. This is not a new thing, actually. The uh, figures that I'm showing you now have been taken many years ago. And if the figures then were like this, just imagine what the costs are today. I checked um, last year in Finland, it was approximately 40 billion just in Finland when we're talking about the well-being. And, and this is highly important topic we're talking about. Uh, what I see now when we're talking about what has been happening during the, the COVID and people were asked what are they, the biggest struggles I guess that these are nothing new if you think about the common sense. People are lacking the collaboration, obviously, remote work does that, loneliness, but this not being able to unblock. I guess that that's one of the things that employers should really pay attention to, how to help people to unblock themselves. And as a leader, I highlight and I feel that we are really needing now the human-centric leadership. And I really mean human-centric leadership. Let's not just talk about it, how we care. Let's show people that we really care and do actions accordingly. And now a little bit about the, the company called Breaks Finland, where I come from and where I'm a CEO. Those are the things that we are uh, facing daily and, and matters that we handle daily. So to put it short, today you will gonna have a really short sneak peek of one of our breaks, uh, guided by our, our fantastic uh, coach, Sara Koivisto. But uh, we offer a sort of a fearless companies opportunities to find the hidden potential of their people in order to be more creative and build and develop new ideas and things. I guess that the things that we need in today's world more than ever and okay, this is a little bit fake news that you're going to see there now. Unfortunately, not being in the Financial Times. But uh, I really state that if you do not invest in your people, you have lost the game already. So people are still the core of your success. And you should be taking extra good care of them, especially now during these times when everything has changed. So what this 
human-centric leadership then leads to. What are the benefits? When you take care of your people, what tends to happen? Well, first of all, they are loyal to you and they are productive. I hate to use productivity when we're talking about people, but um, you know what it means then anyway. But, uh, but I'd rather use that we're gonna enhance them to use their full potential. We're gonna be able to, to see the new ideas of the people when you support them. And of course, I, I like this quote from Richard Branson. Uh, it's an old one, but I always, when it comes up, um, I, I fully agree that uh, the high retention rate comes from when you care for people. So you train and take care of them, and yet they don't want to leave you. And of course, reduced sick leaves comes along as well. But what one other thing that is very often forgotten is the customer experience aspect. You know, your customers are going to see how your people are uh, feeling. And that's often forgotten. You know, and, and who should you, who, you, who would, would you want to do cooperation with? with the ones that you can see that their employees are full of energy, innovation, they're happy and showing it out, or the ones who look like they are in a prison. I, I think that it's, it's quite obvious for me to, with whom I'd like to do cooperation with. How do you see it? How do you feel it? Think about it for a while. And then some tips. It's easy to say that, okay, we acknowledge that there's lots that needs to be done in the well-being aspect. But uh, I really like this quote by Carla Harris. I had an honor to, to uh, listen to her a few years back in Nordic Business Forum, where she was speaking. But um, first of all, trust. Highly important topic. Trust your people and show it to them. Because without trust to them, they will not trust you. And is there any way that they will follow you if they don't trust you? I don't think so. Then secondly, be reachable. Be, be the one that you, it's easy to contact you, especially now in remote times. I've heard in Finland that some CEOs have uh, organized 15 minutes for each employees. Of course, I know that that's for smaller companies in the big corporations not might not be possible but find a way where you can have a where you can lower the uh, possibility for your people to contact you if they feel a need don't let them be alone and then some rules for the communication that would be my third tip now when we are reachable in a way 24 7 you should be the one who tell them that you know is it okay to send messages in WhatsApp 11 o'clock and are people expected to reply immediately, which channels to choose, how often to use them and when not to use them. That's a very important thing also. And then the fourth, the resources. Are the Wi-Fi's working well? How about the laptops? How about the headsets? And then very important thing, are they able to use them or do they know how to use them? You have provided them all and they are unsecure of, you know, how is it working? Especially when I'm thinking about my own mother who started to use Teams. She every time is, is uh, very, um, in a way, upset when it comes to, to using it because she is not really she has not been taught how to use it. All of a sudden, we were expected to use all these channels and new devices. And, uh, and some people were, feel very uncomfortable with them. So please pay attention to that as well. And then the fifth and the most important. Of course, I'm a little bit biased by saying that you should provide breaks. But you should. And it doesn't mean that they need to be breaks from our side. It's just a common breaks, you know, that when you're jumping from Z Zoom to Teams to Hangouts to all these aspects, it's nonsense if you don't even have a break to eat or to drink something, to have a walk outside. 
and you know listen to music do whatever to to break the daily routines of course it can be also breaks from us but uh, uh, but they can be tiny things and important enough is that you as a leader or hr uh, person you are encouraging them to do so be the role model be the, the leader who shows that you know this is how i'm doing it they will follow you again and then as i'm coming from that's the, the well-being side from my side but then um, i'm happy to tell you about the happiness a little bit as i happen to come from the country which has been selected fourth time in a row as the, the happiest country in the world and this is a bit ironic that when you ask from the Finnish people they are a little bit surprised that are, are we the happiest country in the world how is that possible but I would say that they are very basic uh, in, in our um, country very sort of uh, basic things that are well managed and I would put it healthy democracy and equality which matters why we are where we are in this research and, and some of the things I, I want to, to tell you about, and I'm very, of course, happy, but they, they, they are for us um, nothing new. So we are sometimes forgetting to, we're taking them for granted. Our school system, it's brilliant. You know, free education for everyone, regardless where you're coming from. Public schools with high quality teaching, teachers backgrounds, I'm very happy. You can be a professor in the university and no matter where you're coming from that's i think that's the huge thing we have and of course the equality here is the picture of our, our government in in 2019 when 12 of its 19 ministers were women and me as a as a as a female i was very happy about it of course there's a lot lots of things also to be done in finland i'm not saying that we are the the biggest role model but that's a good start and, and something that we should be happy about and perhaps um, the lead others to follow what we've done. And uh, then our public health care is well, well organized. It's, um, it's not too expensive to, to, to everyone can have it. And, and the daycare costs. Uh, I hear many times when I'm talking to my friends in foreign countries that the costs are outrageous. Here they are very very sort of a reasonable price for everyone so parents can get back to work quite uh, quite soon if they want to and then also the the sort of a benefits that the employees employers are offering are quite good you know we tend to have um, five weeks paid holidays here which i guess that it's it's might be quite unusual to many countries that's what we take for granted and it, some some um, organizations offer even longer and then maternity leave or, or paternity leave for nine months uh, that's also something that you get paid during that time and you can spend nine months with your child and even after that there are instruments that support uh, financially if you want to stay longer and then also what I would want to pay up uh, point out is our safe surrounding forests our nature it's beautiful and even my son when he started school he was at age of seven he could walk to school alone and i i know that those are the things that in in some countries that's impossible so i'm um i'm very happy about it and as a Finn, i'd say that Finns are quite honest loyal if we say something we mean it. If, if we ask, how are you doing? We really want to hear, how are you doing? And, and I think that's one of the things that I'm, I'm proud about as a Finn. And here you can see the Northern Lights. If you've never seen them, welcome to Finland. They, they are amazing, they are usually seen in Lapland area. And I want to leave you out with uh, one of the things that Finns are also known, that we are quite modest. We don't want to brag or show off quite often and this is actually our saying whoever is happy should hide it that's how we, we feel about the happiness you shouldn't even tell that you are happy because that's not the Finnish way to, to treat things 
and I've been honored to, to, to be part of this. And if you have any questions you want to uh, connect in LinkedIn and continue discussion with me, please do. I'm, I'm happy to have new connections. And then enjoy the rest of the webinar and I'll sort of hand over to Jackie and, and Sunny greetings from Helsinki. Hi, thanks Jana. Um, yeah, I think I'm with, uh, I've seen some of the comments coming in on the chat, so I think uh, we all want to move to Finland now. So thanks very much for that. Um, so morning everyone. For those of you who are not familiar with Bidwell, I will give you a, a very brief overview. Um, we have over 20 years of experience of helping over 1800 businesses from a variety of industries grow or scale in the UK. Um, we help our customers understand the complexities of UK business culture. Um, our global services cover five departments. So we have governance, finance, HR, payroll, and virtual office. Sorry, I think our slides are, um, are waiting to come up there. There we go, sorry. Um, and we have business advisors who are skilled across all of those uh, departmental areas, which I've, I've just mentioned, which allow our customers to focus on the things that bring value to their business. In terms of why I'm here today, I'm the HR manager at Bidwill. Um, in the HR department, we support the full employee life cycle um, from recruitment to termination. We can also service your advisory or administ administrative needs. Uh, we also help with training and coaching. We can help with um, secondment and sponsorship services. For those of you who are unfamiliar with that, the secondments are relevant if you're sending overseas employees to the UK from an overseas entity. Um, and we work with our immigration and tax partners here too to make sure that you're, you're doing everything correctly and legally. Um, today, I'm going to be covering a few topics. Um, so that will be employer responsibilities in terms of well-being to begin with. We'll also look at some well-being KPIs. Um, how to spot mental health issues in the workplace um, and how to handle those and, and minimize issues if possible. And then also um, what mental health strategies some of the bigger companies in the market are, are adopting and whether um, smaller companies can take any hints or tips and following suit there um, just to see, see what's possible. So if we move on uh, one slide please to employer responsibilities in terms of well-being. Um, employees have a wide range of legal rights protecting their mental health in the workplace. So you should be aware that there are common law protections as well as a general legal obligation to ensure the health and safety of employees at work um, and to provide a safe working environment for employees. Um, there are the um, legislation listed on the, the slide there, but there is the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 um, and also the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations um, 1999. So it's if you, if you want some bedtime reading, by all means, do check those out, but just be aware that they exist. Um, of course, thinking of the current climate, um, this and, and employees working from home, and Jana has spoken about the challenges of remote working on mental health, we do need to bear um, those um, pieces of legislation in, in mind. Breaching the legislation itself doesn't create direct rights for employees to sue employers for compensation, but it can be used in a personal injury case to, to prove a breach of common law duty of care. So just bear that in mind when we're thinking about homework and generally your treatment of mental health in the workplace. <clears throat> if an, an employee does have a mental health issue, it must be taken seriously. Um, as mentioned, you do have a duty of care to include mental health as well as physical health. Um, and most mental health conditions are likely to satisfy the legal definition of disability under the Equality Act 2010. So those with a mental health condition are likely to be protected from disability discrimination um, and they will be entitled to reasonable adjustments from their employer. So also do bear that in mind. Um, so as an employer, it's super important that you know how to spot the signs of um, common mental health issues such as stress, anxiety or depression. Um, you really should be training your line managers on what to look out for um, and what to do if they do suspect or know someone is suffering from a mental health issue. Um, if we think about workplace stress, uh, we've also included a link um, on the slides for a set of management standards and guidelines produced by the, the health and safety um, executive. And these guidelines are effectively best practice on how to deal with stress in the workplace and uh, recommendations of what you need to look at and what you should be abiding by. Um, so they are definitely worth looking into. Um, if, we, if we think about pressure, um, we may experience this frequently, it, it can be motivational, but if we experience excessive pressure, this can feel too much, maybe we can't cope, 
And this is typically when we think about workplace stress and that can lead to employee burnout. Um, and this is a terminology that's bounced around a lot. Um, if you aren't considering your employee's well-being, so including workplace stress, this can lead to employee burnout. Um, employee burnout can lead to poor motivation and productivity, not to mention sickness absence and resignations, which all cost you money. Um, and we will go on to look at some symptoms of employee burnout a little bit later. Um, but if we can look at some specific initiatives you can do in, to try and support um, positive employee well-being, we'll look at those um, in more detail a bit later. But um, initially, things that you can look at would be um, introducing specific mental health practices, putting policies in place that are actually followed, making reasonable adjustments if you need to. So that could include things like flexible working, um, amending employee workloads, phased returns to work, um, organising health and wellness programmes checking in with your employees regularly, and that is super important just to know what's going on in your employees' lives. Um, but in particular, addressing any discrimination. So if you hear anything um, going on in the workplace that could be potential discrimination uh, on the grounds of mental health, maybe you know a little bit of gossip in the workplace or whatever, sounds commonsensical, but it really is important to stamp it out. Um, so if we look at who is responsible in the business for well-being KPIs. We can see that there is a chart on the screen. Um, if we look at the chart, there are three key areas which are important to employee well-being, um, those being social, physical, and mental. And the key reason you want to be focused on your employees' wellness and well-being is engagement. A well-organized nation has well employees. Um, and if you focus on well-being, this impacts your employees' positivity, and that leads to better business outcome, outcomes for you. And I think that was touched on by Jana a bit earlier as well. Um, I think critically, we just need to remember that physical and mental health can't be separated. We need to remember that people's home lives and personal lives do collide, particularly now we're all stuck working at home. Um, so a whole person holistic approach is, is really essential. And uh, good employee engagement combined with well-being means a sustained employee performance and employees who feel trusted and valued. But if we think about what actually well-being KPIs are, um, again, Jana mentioned happiness in, in the workplace and, and what that really means. Um, and it's something that we hear a lot, but how could we define that? Um, we think that it means, you know, how positive someone feels they'll be able to accomplish a goal and feel good about that. And if we break it down further, maybe looking at their contributions plus their satisfaction at making that contribution. So if you're managing to capture how happy your employees are, it can help you identify what's impacting them positively and negatively and how to address that. And the simplest way to do this is to just ask for employee feedback. So you can ask them how they're feeling overall and with regard to specific aspects of their work life. Um, but we also need to remember that, you know, you can do that in various format of ways. You can have a, a direct conversation. You can send an employee well-being survey out, um, have meetings on the topic. But it's only really going to be successful if you do have that transparent, honest and open culture in the workplace um, so that people feel that they can share in a safe space. And of course, not all organisations are there yet. Um, so there are other ways that we can monitor and measure employee feelings. Um, about their wellness programs and, and whether those things are working. And the first would be to track habits. So, um, you know, monitoring how, how people are, how often people are repeatedly taking part in wellness and wellbeing activities being one. Um, also considering other metrics like sick time used, turnover rates, um, the amount of overtime being used. These can all tie back into business metrics and outcomes. So we really should be monitoring wellness or, um, we should be monitoring wellness outcome and metrics and correlating our wellness metrics and business metrics together. So, for example, looking at wellness match metrics and sales outputs to see how wellness is tied into business results. And that can really help if you're communicating that further up the chain. If you're a HR person and you can see that, um, you know, you, you do have an engaged workforce and because your well-being initiatives are, are um are affecting uh, business sales revenue, then of course that, that gives you more buy-in from the leadership team. Um, and, and on that point, I suppose, if we're thinking about who is responsible for web metrics, and of course it's going to be a mix between HR and strategic leaders in the business to collaborate on these points. So if you just move on to the next slide, please. So how we can spot mental health in the workplace. Um, for sure, mental health is 
very much still the elephant in the room in most workplaces. Um, employees are, are scared of being discriminated against. Managers can still feel very uncomfortable on, on the subject, um, maybe because they think they'll make matters worse or because they think that they may um, have legal, legal action taken against them. So we've already outlined the consequences for the employer if um, it matters aren't handled appropriately. So you really need to train your line managers to spot the signs of mental illness. Um, early intervention is the best. Potential triggers for creating mental distress um, and across a, a range of, of mental illnesses can be, you know, working too long hours, not taking breaks, as Jana mentioned, um, unrealistic expectations and deadlines, high pressure environments, unmanageable workloads or a lack of control over work, um, lone working, as many of us are doing now, um, and also negative relationships and poor communication. I know a lot of that must sound pretty commonsensical, um, but this can lead to employee burnout, as mentioned. Um, typically, employees who, who experience burnout are likely to experience that when they expect too much from themselves or they fear that their work isn't good enough, they feel inadequate or incompetent or underappreciated um, or they're just not a good job fit um, and we can't ignore that fact. So in terms of what managers should look out for, particularly when working from home, um, there is a table here which, um, don't worry, I'm not going to read every piece out to you. Um, but just gives you an indication of the different type of, um, of, of poor mental health, um, physical, psychological and behavioural um, symptoms. Um, so it's always good to take a look through those. It isn't to say that if someone has one or more of those symptoms that they do have a mental health issue, we can't and shouldn't assume anything. Um, but often a change, if a change is noticeable, it's not typical behaviour for that employee. Then the key message here is, that it's really good to check in and see if your employee is okay and to try and open the door for that conversation and support. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are suffering from a mental health issue, but just open the door for, for open communication. Um, and we will be circulating the slides later as well. So in terms of handling mental health in the workplace, um, if you do suspect that there is a mental health issue um, or indeed there has been a mental health issue disclosed to you. It's crucial that line managers do facilitate an early conversation about the person's needs to identify and implement appropriate support or adjustments. And basic people management skills are essential. So clearly if an employee doesn't trust their line manager, they're unlikely to want to discuss a sensitive issue with them. Um, this session's far too short to go through a breakdown on how to deal with meetings, but of course we're happy to, to help you if you've got a specific case or initiative that you want to discuss. Um, but basic tips um, would be that, you know, um, most people prefer honest and open inquiries over reluctance to uh, address the issue. Um, it's always better if the manager maybe makes the first move to have that conversation because often employees won't feel confident about speaking up. Um, also, if you want to look at some, um, there's, there's the charity Mind that has a, a lot of uh, good information or hints and tips on how to broach the topic with someone. So that's always really worthwhile checking out. There's a, a lot of information on their web page. Um, but phrase questions in a simple and non-judgmental way. Um, allow the employee to explain the situation in their own words. Be prepared for silences. Be patient. Don't try and talk for the person. Um, and try and explore and address any difficulties which, aren't, which are work-related. And then that can maybe filter through with helping them with coping mechanisms for, for what's going on in personal lives. But again, remember that what goes on at work can affect home and vice versa. Um, and of course, if there is something serious, then it, um, you know, managers should encourage their employees to speak to their GP um, and, and as a first step and, and try and get them some good medical support. And then also find out what are, the, um, what are the facilities you might have in the company. Are there any mental health first aiders, for example, or HR departments? Um, and if you have an, an employee assistance helpline or, or maybe occupational health resources that you can draw on. And if we think about prevention, um, so again, already touched on before, um, good communication and people management skills go a long way to preventing uh, stress and poor mental health among employees. Um, a good induction programme is really important for new employees. Um, starting a new role can be really stressful. Uh, if you already have someone that maybe has some underlying issues, um, then you know, if, if they have poor guidance when they first start work with you and poor expectations and processes, then this can really undermine the person's confidence and it can trigger or exacerbate some existing system, sy symptoms that they may have. 
Um, also, if we think about management style, um, good line management can't exist in a vacuum. Um, so we should really be leading from the top. Um, senior management influence how line managers see their own roles, and this, of course, can trickle down. Um, but we also need to remember that line managers themselves could also be suffering from mental health issues, and they may also need support. I've also mentioned the, the, the HSE guidelines already, to which there is a, a link on one of our previous slides. So um, again, really good to use those within your organisation. Um, and then also build resilience. So focus on building some uh, resilience and coping techniques in the workplace. Um, the most successful would be a three-pronged approach to this. Um, so look to build individual re resilience team and organisational resilience. And then if we look at what the big companies are investing in um, and what maybe uh, smaller entities can do, um, I've looked at um, some bigger players in the market, such as uh, Unilever um, and uh, actually Innocent Drinks as well and Sweaty Betty. Um, with Unilever, they have a wellbeing framework um, and this focuses on four key areas. Um, so they have looked at physical, so looking at health, fitness, diet, sleep and energy levels, purpose, so identifying what really matters to employees and connecting to that as much as possible in everything that they do. And mental, so managing mental choices and reactions to distractions, pressures, challenges and adversity. And also emotional, so finding ways to feel positive and confidently face the challenges that life throws at them. So Unilever believes that um, to build a purposeful business with purposeful brands, they need to encourage their people to bring purpose to work. So they've discovered workshops, uh, sorry, they've developed some workshops um, which are, are labelled Discover Your Purpose. Um, and this is basically to give people the opportunity to identify their personal purpose. And then they will um, put that at the heart of their development and career. They're also looking to break the stigma on mental health. So their approach focuses on culture, leadership, prevention and support. Um, and in that they are educating employees and raising awareness of mental health as well as building capability on mental health support. They provide access to self-help tools for individuals and teams, but have also built a very strong foundation uh, for flexible access to expert mental health support and the ability to have mental health conversations with peers. And how they've done this is by um, providing a, a strong EAP system, um, which not only gives counselling services but, and uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction courses, but there's also life coaching um, and uh, financial wellbeing and resilience training as part of that offering. Um, and they've also uh, trained mental health champions globally. So that um, in their view means that they, uh, their employees have access to peer-to-peer -peer mental health com conversations around the clock. Um, so that's fairly important, I think. Um, also, they, um, they've been looking at the physical side of things. So um, everyday things, uh, they encourage employees to take 20 minutes of physical activity per day, to take breaks, to get mental energy boost, which is again, something that, that Jana touched on. Um, they've also encouraged these for video calls, regular team check-ins, which I think most businesses are probably doing now. Um, uh, we've all been in, in lockdown. Um, but you, uh, Innocent Drinks are also um, following uh, the footsteps of Unilever as well. They've, they've introduced a range of perks that indirectly ease staff's work stresses, such as flexible working hours, uh, free breakfast, free gym membership. Um, and they're encouraging their workers to be healthy and happy through exercise. They have a, a yoga club. They also have uh, mental health resources, um, including an employee assistance program. And Sweaty Betty, um, another example. Uh, they give their employees the chance to join lunchtime yoga class. There's also a running club um, and the opportunity to start later in the day so that employees can concentrate on personal goals in the morning. So although I appreciate it can be hard to find the same level of support as a small business that maybe some of the, the larger companies are doing, of course, things like um, EAP uh, facilities can be difficult to find for a smaller company um, and it, it can be quite costly. But there, there are some elements that you can adapt. So, of course, um, Jana is representing Breaks here today. Um, and there's also another, another company named Perkbox that's quite familiar in the marketplace. Of course, there are other similar companies. Um, but they offer valuable things as part of a package, um, such as an EAP system, um, mindfulness techniques, uh, a very good well-being platform, things like gym reductions or um, uh, like online fitness classes and so on. 
Um, also, if you have private medical insurance for your employees, some of the packages can also offer counselling and gym perks. Um, so that's, that's quite a good thing to look at. Um, what we have done personally at Goodwill as well, we've introduced a buddy system. So for, uh, particularly for our new starters, um, it's been very good to, to give our new starters peer-to-peer -peer support um, rather than always thinking, okay, I need to speak to HR or my manager. Um, so that's quite easy to implement. Um, just also um, encouraging a, a culture of an open door policy to talk about mental health um, and encouraging a more open culture in, gen in general, maybe um, having some mental first aid or training. Um, there is you know, free facilities from the UK government for that. Um, and then core things like exercise classes, clubs, desk yoga, all of those things, although they might take a bit of organisational um, strain, um, they're, they're just cheap things that you can do and, and really are generally quite appreciated. Um, and maybe you can have random coffee catch-ups weekly where, um, you know, it's a, a bit of a, a bingo as to who you're going to be paired up with just to have a catch-up if you're remote working. Um, so you're not sort of losing that water cooler chat um, culture and, uh, and people still have connection with their colleagues. So hopefully that's been, um, been helpful. I am conscious of time and having to, to rush through quite a lot of information. Um, but that's all from me. Um, so I'm going to pass you to Sarah now. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to present you a little mini break session today. So this is what, uh, in mini shortness, what a typical break about voice would be like. And although we just advertised how amazing Finland is, I have to say that mentally and spiritually, my happy place would look something like, I pretend that this is a picture from Hawaii, and this is where I love to escape to. And uh, as Jan already outlined, the philosophy behind our breaks is exactly to offer people in companies who are working hard and having tight schedules and you know all the stresses and hurries we all have in our daily life to have a moment to kind of unplug and de-stress yourself and that's exactly what i'm inviting you to do with me so no matter where you are i hope you have space enough to stand up so first we're going to start by just relaxing our breathing and the breathing is very important for the voice because what happens is when you inhale air into your body we can do it in a, in a way that is kind of uh, calming down the, the nervous system. So that's the first thing we're gonna do. Then we're gonna see how it feels to let out the airflow in a very free, unhindered exhalation. Because when we want to produce sound to speak or maybe even dare to sing, it means that the airflow is making our vocal cords vibrate together. And as long as the airflow is free, unhindered by any unnecessary, unhelpful muscle tensions and tightness in the body, in the breathing muscles and along the whole vocal tract, the vo vocal cords have an easy time to flap together all day. And our vocal cords are moving millions of times during the day. So it's a lot of strain. And if things in the system are unbalanced, then we often start to feel kind of a general feeling of unease. So join me stand up and first we're just going to pretend that we got out of a very long flight so you're just going to stretch yourself make yourself as tall as you want and really open up your body and roll your shoulders leaving your chest feeling kind of wide and open like you have space inside your body for your lungs to expand and something that often people complain about is that their voice feels like it's maybe sometimes a bit tight or caught in the throat. Some of us speak with a very light kind of breathy, whispery sound that doesn't really feel clear and comfortable and doesn't quite carry in a situation where we need to have maybe a bit more clarity in the sound to carry and to sound maybe also a bit more positive. So we want to uh, relax the breathing, starting with your belly. So first thing you're gonna do when you start this aware inhalation is that you relax your tummy. So your belly actually bulges. So this is not the time to be trying to look very thin. You let your upper belly also expand and you feel that your ribs open up. So your lungs have a chance to open up. So this is the way we create a, like a free passage for the air to flow in. And then you're gonna continue by letting out a very free breath. So you don't wanna hold back the breath. And also to open up this channel for our voice to freely travel out with the air, we're going to open up our vocal tract. And this means making a very happy face. So we're in Hawaii, we're gonna be enjoying everything we're gonna do here. So as you take your, your in breath, 
also make a big smile. So you want to show your teeth, feel that you're creating a nice big space inside your mouth because this gives the voice a chance to kind of reverberate and, and uh, resonate inside your mouth. And that kind of gives you free volume. So you don't need to be squeezing the voice from the throat. So you make your, your um, relaxed inhalation, releasing your tummy, releasing your ribs, releasing the space inside your mouth. And then just let out the air and don't hold anything back. And next thing we're going to do is we're going to start the same way. We open up on the inhalation, really open your mouth. And this for a lot of people is something unfamiliar. We're not used to showing our tongues and our teeth. But now you really want to see that as the sound comes out, you don't start to squeeze and, and tighten that space, but you keep everything open. And we're going to do a very open ah vowel. And when you look at yourself in the computer screen, you want to see your tongue very broad and wide and feel that the tip of your tongue is just behind your lower front teeth so that the tongue is not blocking the passage for the free airflow and for your voice to travel out. So take your nice happy Hawaii breath and then let out a very free ah sound. Ah! And the challenge here, at least for Finns, we tend to be kind of shy and keep our mouth very closed. So the challenge here is to actually keep things open as you are making that sound. And let's do it again. And you open up, you release your tummy, release your ribs, make your super happy face so you have space inside your mouth. Ah! And make this big energetic sound. And the point is not that we have to be very loud, but the point is that when we open the vocal tract and let the airflow travel freely in and freely out, carrying the voice outside so people can actually hear us, the vocal cords tend to make a more kind of energetic contact and make this kind of energetic sound. And this little exercise alone, starting from this very free, very comfortable, unhindered, released inhalation, and then letting the air flow out just as freely, just as free of any tension, is in itself an amazing de-stressor. So even if you do this a few times during the day, you get up, stretch yourself, pay some attention to how the breath is flowing into and out of your body and what is happening when you're using your voice. Just try for today. You guys are earlier than we here in Finland. We're already in the afternoon, but you're more in the morning side of things. So for the rest of the day, I invite you to just kind of monitor yourself a little bit. See what happens if you talk with a bit more of a smiley mouth space and you might already have noticed with this little exercise that the sound that you make can actually sound a bit more positive and a bit more happy and i really like the idea that when we talk with somebody we have a meeting or a negotiation with a client or with our co-worker i love the idea that that person will come out of the conversation maybe a tiny bit happier than before we had that little talk or negotiation. So this is what I leave you with today. And I would also like to say that this, of course, was a very surface scratch, just six short minutes. But if you want to dig deeper and uh, get on this journey of breaks with us, you are very welcome to join. Later in the spring, I believe at, towards the end of May, we have some pilot breaks for UK and for Netherlands, and maybe some other countries will come in as well. And if you visit our website, www.breaks.fi, you will find information about those. Uh, later pilots. So now I'm going to hand over, I believe, to Jade for the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. I will definitely try that today um, and see how it goes. So let's move on to our Q&A. Um, we have one question from Jana in the Q&A function. And she's asking, um, when measuring employee well-being, do you consider aspects like air quality, acoustics, spatial arrangements, ergonomics, light level, etc.? cetera? Um, and I could maybe ask Jana to answer this question first. Can you kindly repeat the question? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, of course. 
Um, so when measuring employee well-being, uh, do you consider aspects like air quality, acoustics, uh, spatial arrangements, ergonomics, uh, light level, etc.? Yes, uh, definitely I see the importance of them. Uh, they are important, but in one aspect only, if, if you ask for my opinion, but I think that ergonomy in today's world is very important and especially in remote work related areas that how employers can support their employees in those things, um, super important. I don't know how others feel. Yeah, I don't know if it, Jackie yeah. has anything to add. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think for sure, um, light quality, just generally like a, a safe, pleasant environment is, is clearly going to be preferable. Um, if we're, you know, even taken away from the legal obligation to be able to provide that. So, yes. All right. Um, so what do you think is the best way to keep remote workers engaged at times like this? I think that communication is key. Um, we, we've seen or we've heard lots of businesses failing when, um, you know, they maybe don't have the, the right tech in place to actually um, make sure that their, their employees are, are joined together as one team, not communicating enough. Um, I think that they're, they're the key aspects from my, my point of view. I think communication has got to be top of the tree there. I don't know about yourself, Jana, do you agree? Yes, I, I, I fully agree. And I think that also um, something that uh, came to my mind that somehow clear uh, goals and guidelines as well that mm -hmm. people know that, you know, uh, when are they expected to be like I, I already mentioned that, you know, when are you expected to answer the questions and, you know, um, what are the limits when you should stop and, and somehow make it clear. But that comes also back to communications that, you know, yeah. and, and being open and uh, and, and showing that, you know, this is new for all of us and no one yeah. really knows yeah. what to do. But I think also remembering to check in about non-work topics um, because we're all remote working, we've kind of unfortunately lost that water cooler chat where you're just finding out what's going on in someone's life. Um, and so remembering just to check in, just to have a chat when there isn't necessarily a working reason to do so. Um, so I think that that's really important. Um, all right, now we have a question from Gunnar. Um, is flexible working or working from home or um, in general working away from the office emerging to be an employee benefit and not just something we are doing because of the pandemic? Um, do you see a trend here, Jackie? Um, I mean, to say that it's a, a benefit, well, it could maybe be. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of businesses um, who are looking to maybe make uh, remote working or at least part remote working a new business initiative moving forward because, of course, there's perks for the business as well as the employee to do this. Um, whether we actually call it a benefit anymore, I mean, I, I don't know. There's, there's offices that will be downsizing as a result of this. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I can necessarily answer that in this, in this session. <laughs> um, what about Jana? Have you seen a difference in this in Finland? Um, I think that the, the before pandemic, um, it was a benefit to have a, a possibility mm -hmm. to work from home. But I, I, I fully agree that nowadays it feels like um, that changed. But I guess that what is now happening when hopefully we're getting back to somehow offices one day. I wish that employers could offer, if it's possible, the option to choose, that the mm. employees could, could choose themselves. That, you know, if, if, you, if you're a daily, like if you're driving to work and it takes hours, you know, people might want to have the option that they can decide at which way would be suit best for them. So that could be a benefit if you turn it up that way down. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I think that most of the businesses that we are speaking to are looking to to maybe do a bit sort of half and half. So they're not going to get rid of business premises completely. Um, and there will be some element of, OK, like kind of when do I need to, to come into the office? Um, you know, who, who is going to be there on any given day? Um, so it's, it's obviously going to be beneficial for, for both parties. Um, but to yeah, I think it, it's now no longer seen as necessarily a, a benefit. It's just more of a restructuring, I would say, is probably more 
reflective of our, our current situation. Okay, um, then we have a question from Kati. Um, what kind of attention do you pay for lunchtime and healthy lunch? Um, do you, for example, um, have some sort of regulations how long the lunchtime needs to be? Um, and do you encourage your um, workers to eat healthy by, for example, um, introducing some sort of um, sessions together? Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, legally we have uh, legal requirements for breaks when someone works a, a minimum amount of time. It's quite usual in the UK to, um, if you work at full full-time hours, that you'll take an hour for lunch. Um, in terms of forcing people to do that, well, you have limitations in terms of what you can do there. Um, in terms of the actual um, healthy eating side of things, a lot of businesses, when people were in the office, would do things like, you know, have fruit baskets sent to work to try and encourage healthy eating. And that's always a, a good thing. That's, uh, that's obviously a, a corporate um, measure to be taken. In terms of, um, of getting people together for lunch, then yeah, team lunches are always great. And again, that's something where the business can obviously purchase lunches for, for um, the group of employees. We don't necessarily have a culture where we do lunch vouchers or anything, which um, often happens in lots of other countries where it's maybe part of their, um, their salary in, in lots of other European countries. Um, so yeah, there, there are measures that you can take um, to encourage it. Okay, um, I don't know if Jana has anything to add to this one. Yes, in Finland, um, I think that what has been rising, it's a delivery called Bolt, or, or it, um, you can order food, and some companies offer that as a benefit for the employees. We, um, some companies do offer lunch, lunch vouchers, and I think that the, the business in for Bolt they has been uh, growing quite a, quite a bit when, when people are like like myself, you know, getting a little bit of uh, fed up with the, the same kind of lunches and, and you, you tend to even skip it sometimes. And, uh, mm -hmm. but, but in some businesses, obviously, when, when you, you can't work remotely, that's, that's a different scenario. But uh, I think that some, some um, th those type of things may occur here in Finland, even more common, that that's like a benefit that you can then order healthy lunch. <coughs> All right, um, Jana, so what would you say uh, with employees aging from mid-20s to mid-60s, um, how does employee well-being differ between these two age groups? Oh, that's a hard one, but of course they differ because the, the life situation is so different. When I'm co comparing myself, having three small children compared to the ones who don't I'm, I'm in a in a definitely different role and you know that the well-being aspects for me are completely other than the, the sort of uh, just at the beginning of their work life where you might um, uh, for me the time and and a freedom to choose and do things according to my schedule is is uh, is a benefit whereas I think that well can be a benefit also to to younger ones but um I think that that's a hard question how much they differ. I think that the load of work uh, uh, could be that when, when you are getting a bit older, uh, that it would be important to pay attention to, you know, that how much can you take? Is it is it like when I remember myself being um, 20, um, I could adapt to situations a lot faster than in nowadays, to be honest. And I think that's something also to keep in mind. How does Jackie feel about this? Yeah, <laughs> excuse me. I think I agree that in terms of people are, are, are stereotypically speaking at different stages of their life and they have different wants and needs. Um, so if we think of, you know, people in their, their 20s or, or whatever, they're maybe more focused on um, maybe, maybe having flexible hours to, to go with their party lifestyle perhaps. <laughs> Um, but then, you know, it's, uh, there will be other requirements for, for other people later in life. So it's, um, it's, all, it's all very subjective, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Um, Mike was asking, um, since, of course, there have been some psychological challenges uh, for people um, when working from home, but have you 
experience the positive side of this. Um, she po also points out that um, having three young kids, uh, sometimes it's been easier to work from home um, and sh shuffle that schedule uh, when you don't need to sit in the office for certain hours. Yeah, I mean, I, I can briefly say that for sure. Um, particularly in, in London with working from home, like I think um, people have really benefited from not needing to commute. So there's maybe more time for exercise time and you know healthy things spending more time with family of course with children it can be quite flipped can't it like it's great spending lots of time with them but if you're trying to work depending on the age group of the kids it can also cause a lot of stresses if they're not able to go to school um due to, to the pandemic so um lots of pros and cons there but i think that most people have um maybe identified that they don't need to go to the office every day and they can still do what they need to do from home and maybe they have a better work-life balance. Yeah, I fully agree. I, I think that the, also when I know my schedule for the day, that I can choose that um, whether I come to our studio and, and, and or if I stay home, uh, the kindergarten is almost next to where, where I live. But I have to admit that the time when uh, there was a lockdown here and all the kids were home school, home kindergarten and me working, I felt like I, I, I salute the people who have done that for a long time because for, for me the two months were I think that the longest months in my life you know having the kids running around and trying to 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 prepare some meal and and having the issue that being the mother of the year when when I, I just tried to cope and manage and it was really uh, I think that for for small smaller children's parents uh, quite a heavy time to be honest yeah, I can imagine. Um, thank you for the answers. Um, we still have quite a few questions remaining unanswered, but I'm sure Jana and Jackie can um, answer those questions by email. Um, so thank you, Jana, Jackie and Sara. Um, and thank you to all of our participants for today. Um, we will be setting out the recording um, probably by tomorrow and uh, Jana and Jackie will answer the remaining questions later on via email. Um, thank you, everyone, and have a lovely day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.